Hey friends, welcome back to my kitchen today. We're gonna to be working on some bone broth here today, over the next couple of days actually. So our pantry is completely void of bone broth right now. We usually keep a lot on hand, um, canned bone broth, but we're completely out. I should have done this probably three weeks ago and I haven't, so today is the day. We're gonna get started. I'm gonna bring you through the process from start to finish and then we're gonna go on to even pressure can the bone broth. You can freeze your bone broth, so that's not really a necessary step. So, you know, this video is still great for anybody who wants to make a good nutrient dense bone broth but doesn't want to pressure can it or doesn't have a pressure canner there's other ways you can save your bone broth and preserve it so um, we'll talk about that as we go on but for now we're going to get started um, i'm going to show you how we make our favorite favorite variation of bone broth let's get started all right of course we're going to start with our wonderful big stock pot this is a really really nice stock pot i get asked a lot actually where we got this um, it's a really nice like heavy bottom stock pot and it's suitable for all cooktops. We got this on Amazon actually. I'll link it in my Amazon shop just in case you are interested in checking it out but it is a fabulous fabulous big stock pot. Highly recommend it. All right so what we have here is all from our freezer. These are just carcasses from turkeys and chickens left over from you know when we roast our chickens or turkeys. We always keep the carcasses um for this purpose so we just bag it freeze it and we take it out when we need it so we have a variation here and this is key so you can do this with all chicken carcasses but adding turkey carcasses to it is a game changer it enhances the flavor so so much um, it's just absolutely fabulous all right so we're going to get these in the pot so I don't really measure this out, I should say. Kind of like anything in the kitchen here. Now you can see I dumped in actually some chicken. My husband took all this out for me and I guess he thought that was chicken carcasses. I didn't realize till I dumped it in, but that's okay. That's gonna go in there anyway. And what we'll probably do, we'll probably, probably pull some of this chicken out after it's all simmered down and we'll uh, give it to the doggies so they have some good food all right so it's like pretty much full well like three quarters full i don't want to fill it any more than that because it'll just boil over but there's not really any specific amount of carcasses i put in here it's just kind of depends on how much broth i want to want to make but basically however whatever level the bones are at that's kind of where i put the water so i'm going to bring the water right up to here and uh, let that all boil down we're going to top this with filtered water. It's your preference. You don't have to use filtered, but I prefer filtered because I just don't like all the crap that's in our municipal water supply. All right, I don't have quite enough water in here yet. I'm waiting for more to filter, but we'll get everything else put in there while we're waiting. So you can add some onions. Um, for us, we keep all of our onion skins and onion pieces and ends. It's all organically grown here, so we don't mind saving it. And I just freeze it in little Ziploc bags like this, and I toss it into broths when I'm doing my broths. So um, I'm gonna toss this in, but if you don't have something like this, um, you can just use regular onions. I'd probably, probably put maybe two onions in this size pot. And if you have organic onions, you can use the skins as well. The skins have lots of nutrients in them as well for things like this. So you don't really have to peel all that off. You can leave all that intact. So let's see. Probably won't put, oh uh, yes I will. I'm gonna toss it all in. What odds? All right, so that's onions. The next thing we're gonna add is some garlic. So I just have some freeze-dried garlic here I'm gonna to add to it. You can add probably to that. We like a lot of garlic, so I'd probably add like maybe six, seven, eight cloves at least. I don't know, a lot. Um, but it really depends on what you like. So we're just gonna do some freeze-dried garlic in there. All right guys, we're gonna grab some herbs for our broth. This is our kind of 
messy herb cupboard that really needs cleaning up desperately. All right, so you can pretty much kind of add what you want, but pretty standard, we add freeze-dried celery. Um, you can add fresh celery if you have it, but I have loads of freeze-dried celery leaves, so we're gonna add that. We're gonna do some freeze-dried sage. I love sage, my favorite, favorite herb, I think. If I had to choose, this would be the main one I'd grow, for sure. So we're gonna add loads of that. We're going to add some rosemary. We're going to do some bay leaves. We'll add a few of those. Um, what else? Probably a little bit of savory, even though I'm extremely low on savory. I really have to grow more of this because we love savory, but I didn't get a lot last year, so I'll have to bump that up this year. We're gonna add peppercorns, but I don't know where my peppercorns are right now. This cupboard desperately needs to be cleaned up. So that's pretty much all we're gonna add. Um, you can add turmeric as well if you like turmeric. Well, we're not gonna add that to our broth today, but that can definitely add a lot of nutrition and anti-inflammatory um, benefits to your broth. But yeah, that's pretty much it, along with the garlic that we already got in there. Yeah, we have marjoram up here too. We could add that or oregano, kind of anything you really want to add to give lots of good flavor. The other thing we're gonna add is just a dash of apple cider vinegar. This is not necessary, but it's said to help draw out the nutrients in the bones, the acidity in this. So we'll add a bit, but again, not a necessary step. You can also add root crops if you have carrots or um, different things you wanna add, cabbage sometimes I'll add, leeks, um, any of that stuff. So it's really just to enhance the flavor of the broth. So I'm gonna get some more filtered water now, hopefully, and top this up, and we're gonna let this simmer. All right, guys. I'll show you this is about an hour later so you can see we got a nice little simmer going on you can see it's already looking like a wonderful broth so we're gonna let this simmer down for like 24 hours actually um, everybody does a little bit different some people if you don't want a really rich broth you can just do it for like 12 hours even we like a really really rich concentrated broth so we're gonna go 24 um, I'm actually going to top this up with a bit more water. I'm going to come up probably a couple of inches from the top. It's going to boil down anyway over the course of 24 hours. Now at night I'll turn this really down low so it won't be simmering quite the same at night but it'll still be kind of seeping out all those wonderful nutrients from the bones. Alright guys it's been 24 hours exactly so you can see how much this has boiled down and you can see how rich that is it's just beautiful so we're gonna get this all strained off um, what I'm gonna do actually is take a lot of those bones as much as I can out of this before I strain it because this is like really really heavy um, it just makes it easier so I'm gonna do that first All right, so basically what we're gonna do, we're gonna use our bone broth just like this to um, can. Now you can, and actually I think it's safe canning practices to do so, but you can cool this off and then skim any fat off the top of it. I don't typically do that with turkey and chicken broth for the most part, but um, you can. I don't find I get enough skimmed off to justify. Sometimes the excess fat can impact your seal on your canning. Um, if I was doing a beef or a pork or something like that with more fat content, I probably would definitely do that, but I don't typically do that, just so you know. All right, let's grab our 
jars. So I just usually wash my jars in the dishwasher. Um, for pressure canning, you don't need um, sterilized jars. They only need to be clean. And I find the dishwasher is just quicker for me. So let's get them all out of here. So I've said this in previous videos, but just in case you're new here and you haven't seen it, these jars, in case you're wondering what they are, because they're not a typical uh, mason jar, but these are from classical brand spaghetti sauce. Uh, we used to buy it a lot one time when it used to be cheap. You used to be able to get like five for $10. Now I think it's like two for 10. Um, and that's like a drastic change in the last couple of years, like everything else. So we don't buy it anymore. We just make our own now. But um, yeah, we have a lot from years ago and they work beautifully for pressure canning, uh, water bath canning, anything. I've never had an issue, I've never had any break. Um, <laughs> knock on wood hopefully today is not my first day but they're the perfect size for broths and stuff like that so that's what I use it for a lot um, the mason jar like the regular ring and lid fits perfectly on these jars so yeah reuse right so they're perfect so that's what I'm gonna be putting the broth in today all right so this is our 23 quart presto canner this is an old canner um, fairly old we've had it for several years now and it's done us just fine. So a couple of things we kind of look at before we start pressure canning. I'm gonna get this set up before I pour my broth into my jars. So of course we look at the gauge, make sure it's tight, make sure there's no issue with the seal here. Um, I had issues one time with the seal on this and I mentioned it in a previous video as well, but in case you didn't see it, there's a little white gasket underneath here um, I had that break because I was removing this gauge after every single use and putting it back on and it just wreaked havoc on that um, gasket. So I had to get a replacement and I just leave it intact now. So this little thing here, we're gonna look through this and make sure we can see through it because, kinda looks dirty, <laughs> this has got a lot of use. Um, you want to be able to see through that because sometimes that can get clogged with stuff and that's your vent So you want to make sure that is clear So that's one of the the things you should do with your pressure canner before you actually use it This you want to make sure this pops up freely And This you want to make sure that's intact as well. There's nothing like crudding that up So it's kind of like little checks um, I've never had this calibrated. I think a lot of thing companies recommend getting these calibrated and checked. I've never done that, I gotta be honest. I don't even know where I'd get that done. So yeah, I don't, but maybe you should. So that's just the gasket that goes around the inside of this lid. I take it off every time so I can get the inside cleaned up. Um, I don't know if it's necessary, but just kind of fits in there like that. This is our little weight that we're gonna put on the uh, steam vent once we get it to a certain point, and I'll show you all that in the process. This is just um, a tray to go in the bottom of the canner. So you shouldn't put your bottles right on the bottom of this directly on the surface because it can cause breakage. So you do have to have like a little spacer in between. This is what comes with it. I don't really know what causes all that black. I've tried to get it off before. I've kind of had success, but it's like a big ordeal each time. Anybody have any ideas? I think it's like an interaction with the uh, rings, some kind of chemical reaction or something. I don't like it so much, I gotta say. that's. One thing that kind of disturbs me a little bit about this. I don't know if the All-American canner does this too. Um, anybody that uses the All-American, let me know. Does this happen with that one? Because if not, I may switch. But for now, this does me really well. So we're gonna put that in the bottom and we're gonna put three liters or three quarts of water in the bottom of this canner. All right, so that's pretty standard for um, pressure canning it's always the same amount so yeah it's probably I don't know two inches of water maybe something like that 
So we're gonna turn this on to start heating up that water and we're gonna come over and start filling our jars. All right, I find it a bit quicker just to use a measuring cup like this and fill my jars for, with broth anyway. It's just easier than using a ladle and doing like, you know, a hundred spoonfuls. <laughs> So you can see my broth is hot. So my jars are hot from the dishwasher. My broth is hot. I have this one too full accidentally. So I will take some of that out. So basically what we're going for is uh, one inch headspace. So your headspace is what uh, the distance from the top of the jar down. So if you come right to the bottom of this like um, threaded uh, rim, I guess I'll say, it, that's an inch. Okay, so if you come to the bottom of that, you're at an inch headspace. So that's about an inch right there. So you can see this one, I'm way too full. So I'm gonna take some of that out. Um, headspace is very important, and the best way to determine what headspace you need is to use a, a guide for safe canning. Everything's different. You know, jams and things like that usually is like a quarter inch. Um, usually broths and anything like pressure canned, I find tends to be one inch. So, um, oops, but best to follow something out of like a ball canning book or some sort of test it um, recipe, I'll say. Usually when you buy a canner as well, like this Presto canner came with its own guide and it has some recipes and it'll tell you what headspace to use for certain things, that kind of thing. All right, I'm just gonna top this one up a smidgen, just with a bit of water, it's not gonna hurt. All right, I'm just gonna use a cloth with vinegar on it. I know, I'm using paper towel. I usually use a cloth, but all of my dish cloths and all my extra cloths are all in the washer. So, so this is a very important step because you don't want any residue on this ring at all because that can cause seal failure. So it's very important to clean the top, but it also gives you the opportunity to kind of feel if there's any chips or anything like that because if you have any chips in the top of your jar you can't use that jar. I like to use vinegar because especially for stuff like this because it'll kind of help break down any fats that are there. This one I have to clean really well because I poured off of this one so there's a lot of broth there so we'll do that last. All right we're just going to drop our clean lids right on top and these are brand new lids they're not reused I don't reuse my lids I know there are a lot of people that do but I do not all right so these are our rings these tend to rust after so many uses so I always make sure I use rings that don't have any rust on them so you're just going to make sure you go just finger tight. You don't want to over tighten these. All right, we're going to get them into the pressure canner. My water is hot down here. So you always want to do kind of hot to hot or cold to cold. You don't want to have hot liquid jars going in cold water or cold jars going in hot water that's going to increase the risk of breakage as well. Now, I'm not going to fit all these in one shot. Unfortunately, I'll have three left over. I'll decide what I'm going to do with that. I may do a second um, batch or I may just do one and I may actually just refrigerate these and use them. Um, in the next week or so. All right, just put the cover on so it goes down like that and then you slide this just like that to lock it. 
that locks it in place. All right, so now that we have this all locked in place, we're gonna keep this on high until we see steam coming out of here. When we see steam coming out of here, we're gonna time it for 10 minutes. After steam is flowing steadily out of here for 10 minutes, then we put this on. Once we put that on, you'll start to see the pressure rise. So I'll show you it as it kind of happens, but for now, we're just gonna watch until we start getting steam here. All right, steam is coming out of there. I don't know if the camera is gonna pick it up. Oh yeah, I think it is. So we'll let that steam for about 10 minutes. All right, so we have our little weight on. So what's gonna happen now, we're gonna try to do a little balancing act with our temperatures and get this pressure at the right pressure. This little thing in the back is gonna pop up. Once that pops up, we know it's pressurized. Then you'll start actually seeing the gauge go up. So we're aiming for this gauge to be at about 10. And that's from the guide. I don't make that up. And that actual pressure gets adjusted depending on your altitude. So every stove is different, but for me, I keep mine on about medium when I'm trying to just get this pressure to start going up. And then when I get to about kind of two to three below my goal, goal uh, pressure on the gauge, I'll turn it down even lower because I want to balance it right at 10. That's really a kind of a balancing act that you'll learn how to do as you go along. All right, we're about probably two pounds or so below where we're supposed to be, so I'm gonna turn my dial on my stove top temperature just down ever so slightly. We want this to really just start creeping up now slowly because you don't wanna get up too high. All right, we're pretty much at 10 pounds of pressure, as you can see there. Uh, this is where the balancing act really begins. So we want to maintain it at that pressure. So we really have to be watching it to make sure it doesn't go above. Um, you may have to adjust the dial on your stovetop temperature. I don't tend to anymore because I kind of got a feel for how this stove goes. But when I first started pressure canning, I had to be adjusting a lot. You don't want any significant fluctuations in your pressure uh, because that can lead to siphoning, which means uh, fluid can come out of your jar into your pot. So I'm gonna put my timer on for 25 minutes now that we're at the right pressure. All right, so I had two extra bottles um, that I couldn't fit into that pressure canner. I had three actually, but I'm using one for gravy for today. Um, the other two I actually just emptied into, let's see if that's going to focus, um, yogurt containers that I have left over. So I save this size yogurt container all the time for freezing things. So I'm just going to freeze these two containers of bone broth just because I'm not running the pressure canner again for two bottles. Not going to happen. It's just not worth it in my opinion. So you can freeze it. It freezes really well. Um, I do it all the time and it's a great way to preserve your bone broth as well if you don't want a pressure can or if you don't have a pressure canner you can freeze it and that's a great size to freeze it in. So I'll get those labeled and in the freezer I have to label it because I always forget what's in it or when I put it there. So put a label on it so that you don't forget. All right, 25 minutes is up, so we're gonna take this off the burner. I like to remove it from the burner, some people don't. You can just let it cool there naturally if you want. I'm just gently removing it from the burner. We're just gonna let it sit here until it's completely depressurized. So our gauge is gonna go down to zero, and that little uh, valve in the back there is going to pop back down. That's how we know it's safe to take the cover off. So. We'll just let it sit there for a while and we'll come back and finish it off when it's done. All right, our pressure canner is ready to open. Our gauge is back to zero and the little thingy in the back, I don't even know what it's called, valve, I don't know, is popped back down. So that means the pressure is all gone from the canner so we can open it up safely. So we'll pop this um, weight off. Now there's gonna be a lot of steam in here, so just be careful when you're opening it. 
So you're just doing the opposite of what you did to close it. Just twist it and open it up. All right, I am going to put this right here. All right, lots of hissing going on. So we're just gonna use these bottle lifters to lift them up carefully. So you can see how gorgeous that is. And it's still, you can see it's still like boiling inside. So you have to be very careful with these. So we'll put them just over on a, an old sort of tea towel that I got set up. All right, these are extremely hot. You can see they're still rapidly boiling here. Um, that happens with pressure canning. That's perfectly normal, but they all look fabulous. There was no siphoning of any of them because the amount is still the same. If you take it out of the pressure canner and you see the liquid has um, come down, they're all popping like crazy now. The liquid has come down significantly. That means you probably had siphoning. And sometimes that's because of pressure changes going up and down too fast. So within about a half an hour or so, you'll start to see, you'll start to hear them all pop one by one. It's like the canner's favorite sound. And you'll see the center goes down in the middle and that just means that the cover is sucked down onto uh, your jar. So that one is sealed now. Um, so tomorrow morning, we're gonna leave these undisturbed overnight. Tomorrow morning, I will take the outer ring off and I'll just do a little lift test. Um, actually, I found one bottle of bone broth. I said I had none left, but I found one right here from before. So I'll show you what I mean by the lift test. So tomorrow morning, once I know these are all, you know, cooled and they've been sitting for 24 hours, I take the rings off, I give them a good cleaning around it, and I do a lift test. So I basically take it and lift it by the cover. Um, and just to make sure it was it's sealed properly and there's no seal failure. You know, you might go to lift it and it comes right off. You know that's not sealed and you have to put it in your fridge to use within a few days. So that's what I call the lift test and I do it on every single jar that I can just to make sure there's a good seal there. Um, usually with pressure canning, it's a really, really, really good seal. All right, that's all there is to it. It's as simple as that to make your own nutritious, wonderful bone broth and pressure can it. So super simple and it is a wonderful thing to have on hand in your pantry. I will note, I didn't add any more salt to this. It was a little bit salty. I forgot to mention that throughout the video, but I didn't add any more. I will probably add a little bit as I use it, you know, to taste as needed, but that's totally your preference. You can add salt if you want. The thing is, once you add the salt, you can't take it back out. So I prefer to keep it a little bit lower on the salt uh, scale and just add it as I need to in cooking. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video today. Thank you so much for joining me in my kitchen and we'll see you again on the next one. Bye.